So I'm gonna get straight to the point. Today I'm going to talk about the Brahmos cruise missile, which is most notably used by India. So Brahmos can be launched from submarines, ships, aircraft, or land. So it's multi-platform launch, uh, and the reason it is so notable at the moment, at least, is because it is the fastest cruise missile on the planet. So it travels at Mach 2 to 3, but realistically Mach 2.8 generally for cruising speed. And it uses a ramjet engine in order to do that. So it goes supersonic and it's one of the few cruise missiles to do so. And the reason this speed is advantageous is because it's pretty difficult to intercept. It's difficult to shoot down. So if you have uh, surface-to-air missiles, uh, you know, let's take on a ship, for example, you have the classic uh, CRAM trying to, or Sea Sparrow missiles, trying to launch and intercept any sort of incoming threats or Iron Dome-like systems. It's incredibly difficult to do that because these intercepting missiles don't have the ability to manoeuvre properly in order to intercept Brahmos. It travels too fast to be intercepted by most things. So, in regard to who it's manufactured by, it's Brahmos Aerospace, as you can probably guess, but the history behind that is it's a combination, pretty strange combination, between Russia and India, of India's uh, Defence Research and Development Organisation, and Russia's NPO, uh, and I'm not quite sure how to pronounce it, but it's something like uh, Machinostrainia. Anyway, two massive defence organisations from both countries. Russia, who is, again, a large partner in the project, doesn't really use Brahmos, certainly hasn't fired Brahmos, because it has a cheaper equivalent called the P-800 Onyx, uh, which is, for Russia, more cost-efficient, and that's an advantageous thing for them. Brahmos is not so cost-efficient. It costs about £4.2 million pounds at the moment, so about $5 million. Uh, and that's pretty expensive for sort of classical-use cruise missile. In regard to specifications, it's got a mass of 300 kilograms, and I think the air-launched variant is 2,500 kilograms heavy. The length is 8.4 meters, the diameter is 0 0.6 meters, and in regard to in regard to its warhead, it does use it utilizes a fairly small warhead in comparison to something like Storm Shadow or Tomahawk. Its advantage is speed, not necessarily warhead size or impact. So it uses a 200 kilogram to 300 kilogram, depending on the variant, conventional semi-armor piercing warhead. So in regard to the engine, which is the thing I find pretty much the most interesting about Ramos, it has a two-stage engine, as all ramjets generally have to have. The first is a rocket booster, which is, I think, solid fuel. And the second stage is a ramjet, which is, I think it's liquid propellant. And both of those are manufactured by the Ordnance Factory Board. So, in regard to its speed, it doesn't necessarily aid range. So it's incredibly fast, but in regard to some other missiles like Tomahawk, uh, it doesn't you know, quite match them in range. So the air platform, I think, can travel 190 nautical miles to about 220, again, depending on sort of various circumstances, uh, maneuvering required to actually reach the target. Generally, that's something that changes depending on the target you're trying to strike. The target might not be stationary, and it depends on the variant. Uh, in regard to the sea launch platform, so that's for ships and submarines, it's got about 320 nautical mile range. The surface launch platform, which will be launched from a mobile launcher, has a 380 nautical mile range, so that has the highest range, which is something, you know, you don't necessarily often see sort of mobile launch platforms having such effort being put into them. Generally, the naval variant is the one that has the highest range. In any case, in regard to its flight altitude, it flies incredibly low. It has incredible guidance systems. So it's sea skimming, 
as most cruise missiles are, and have been for quite a while, but it can travel as low as three to more four meters above the surface. So it doesn't, you know, just stay above, uh, below the radar, it's practically in the ground. Its maximum speed, as I've said, is Mach 3. But in order to achieve this, in order to be sea skimming as low as three to four meters above the surface, while traveling supersonic, it has to have incredible guidance systems. So currently, it uses uh, a mid-course inertial navigation system, and for the terminal stage, active radar homing, as a lot of cruise missiles do. But for the mid-course, at least, this allows it, I guess you'd say, superior maneuverability to a lot of fast-moving missiles. So I don't think the Onyx has the same sort of maneuverability as Brahmos because it is more cost efficient. And obviously you've got the underlying GPS satellite guidance, uh, but all of this sort of guidance, uh, all of these guidance systems, they give it incredible accuracy within one meter, which is, you know, for something that travels that fast, that's pretty impressive. Anyway, I'd like to talk about the ramjet now because that's the thing I really that's the thing I really find interesting about Brahmos. So, like most ramjets, it needs a solid booster in order to gain enough speed because a ramjet needs speed to work. So, what a ramjet is, I'll try to explain it simply in a minute. But effectively, you've got uh, an engine with no moving parts, so it relies upon something's velocity moving at supersonic speeds, the shockwaves created from that in order to create pressure differentials, uh, which then push air through and create the temperatures needed for combustion. Anyway, so while the ramjet does have some incredibly complex science behind it, I'm going to try to simplify it, probably haphazardly. So, Ramos's ramjet has three main parts. So you've got the diffuser at the front, at the entrance to the jet, um, a combustion chamber and a nozzle at the end, at the rear of the exit. So if you imagine something traveling super, supersonic speeds, so it's broken the sound barrier, it sort of creates a conical uh, shockwave pattern. So these conical shockwave patterns, what it basically means is that anything on the cone uh, or the nose of the cone of this shockwave is under immense pressure and this immense pressure creates immense temperatures. So generally what you have at the front is as I said this diffuser. So diffusers are a cylindrical ring with a I guess you'd say a splaying component in the middle. So you have this cylindrical ring. If you imagine the point of the nose of the cone of this shockwave pattern, that's the point under the highest pressure. So if you've got a cylindrical ring, if you imagine a circle is sort of infinite points arranged, you have near infinite uh, noses of this shockwave cone, which are under immense pressure. And what that means is that you have a convergence of lower pressure, still high pressure, but lower pressure air in the center of this ring. So you need to have this sort of splaying device which increases the streamlining of air towards these areas of high pressure. But in any case, what you've effectively done by not only getting rid of this lower pressure air, but pushing this higher pressure air into your, I guess, engine, is you have created an area of high temperature and you've created immense pressure differential between the front end and the rear end. So front end, massively high pressure, the rear end, lower pressure. And so what you do is you effectively have this diffuser at the front and it's channeling high pressure air into the combustion chamber and also preventing the spillover of air sort of over the sides, increasing aerodynamics. So. Once we've got this high pressure air inwards, one injects the fuel in, which is some sort of, normally hydrogen is used, but I think in this case it's uh, some sort of liquid propellant. 
anyway, um, this fuel chamber allows the fuel to combust due to the high temperatures caused by the high pressures. And that means that the air continues to travel at further incredibly high speeds, propelling the aircraft forward and creating thrusts or pushing out the back. So a lot of thrust is generated. Uh, and this is obviously generally only in one direction, massively only in one direction, because you have such high pressure air coming in at the intake, at the diffuser. So you've also then got at the exit, what's called a converging diverging nozzle. So if you imagine it in a sort of hourglass shape, you've got the combustion chamber here and it sort of narrows and then spreads out again. This would slow subsonic air, obviously, but given the air is supersonic, due to the shockwave pressure and due to the uh, conical shockwave pattern, this segment uh, of the missile actually allows the air sort of pushed out of the, pushed out of the end to be pushed out with higher thrust. It also disperses the thrust in a manner that means that the missile is stable and it's got sort of constant propulsion as opposed to a very, very thin, I guess you'd say line of propulsion that doesn't keep the cruise missile so stable. And that actually generally aids in maneuverability. So that's how it produces its thrust. That's how the ramjet engine works. Anyway, to talk a little about the future of BrahMos, because BrahMos is a very notable missile. India has talked about working, and we assume is working, on BrahMos 2. So BrahMos 2 is going to be even faster. They aim to achieve it in about seven to eight years, but it's going to be incredibly, incredibly fast, traveling at about Mach 8, which is, again, I don't think any missile has ever traveled that fast, let alone a cruise missile. But effectively what they're doing is they're streamlining this sort of ram ramjet design and increasing the, I guess, intake patterns so that it can be turned into a scramjet. So if you imagine the sort of curve of fuel efficiency when compared to thrust or muck, so it's sort of a graph that goes like that. So if you've got on this axis fuel efficiency and on this axis the x-axis muck, uh, up here you sort of have classic uh, turbofan engines, you'd have like turbo prop up here. Turbofan engines and then you get sort of wet turbofan engines, so turbofan with afterburner, and then you sort of reach a more constant level. So as this graph begins to level off, at this point, you get much faster, but uh, fuel efficiency is far less. You have ramjet engines, and then eventually you can make that more efficient, turn it into, you know, scram and shram jet engines. But in effect, you can make things far, far faster. Effectively, the curve of fuel utilization begins to drop off. So as you turn this into a SRAM or SRAM jet engine, it's going to be uh, marginally, it's marginally diminishing fuel utilization. In any case, that's what they're working on, and they're apparently going to get it to Mark 8 somehow. In regard to other innovation with BrahMos, they're also talking about what's called their UCAV variant. So this is sort of a specialized variant, which you would assume would be probably used for uh, sort of naval and land strikes. It would be able to deliver its payload and return to base. So this would actually probably be a brilliant utilization of BrahMos's inherent design, using its speed to actually, I guess, inject ordnance into the target, create precise strikes, and then be able to return home. So you maximize, basically, uh, something's warhead sort of potency, uh, and you can create a dedicated warhead that doesn't get in the way of the general jet mechanism. And then you can sort of utilize a second ordnance to create maximum impact 
and it's pretty difficult to hit. It's difficult to intercept due to its speed, which, considering they're innovating to get Mark 8 in 7 to 8 years, will probably be faster than Mark 3, particularly the second ordinance. So that's about it for Brahmos. Uh, I think it's pretty interesting. I think the use of ramjets is pretty interesting in the sort of innovation of cruise missiles. Although I think generally with, I guess you'd say Western cruise missiles, France, the UK and the US, generally they're not investing so much in supersonic cruise missiles. This is something pretty unique. They're investing in something that has a larger impact. They're investing in something that has superior range, that has superior coordination when launched with other ordnance units. So we'll see what happens, but I think both the engine and the navigation systems, particularly the inertial navigation system that allows it to fly at three to four meters above sea level, I think that sort of technology is going to be implemented far more widely than this sort of supersonic uh, ramjet technology is within cruise missiles, or at least to the point of innovating to Mark 8. But we shall see what happens. So I think I will leave it there because I have kind of rambled. So there we go. Thank you.